This is Computer Programming One from the University of Washington. I'm Martin Dickey. Welcome back. Today is a lecture I've been looking forward to. We're going to be talking about structures. I'm looking forward to it for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's extremely interesting and useful material. Secondly, it may be the last or almost the last lecture in which I have to introduce some new syntax. There's another reason why structs is very important. And if someone reminds me, I will tell you what that is after the summary slide for this lecture. Today we'll be reviewing the concept of data structures. And from that, go immediately into the main topic, which are heterogeneous structures, or structs, as they are called in C. We'll see how to define structs using type def. We'll see how to get inside them with the dot operator. And we'll talk about structs as parameters, both call by value and using pointer parameters. Data structures. This is a concept we've seen before. Functions help us to organize programs. We also need a way to organize data, especially when there's lots of data, variable amounts of it, or where there are sets of data, the pieces are related to one another in some way. Now we've seen arrays, and arrays help us with the first two points. Arrays are very good to help organize large amounts of data. But there are some things that arrays can't do. One of them is that all the values in an array have to be of the same type, and that's not always the case. Arrays also don't show how things are related. Let's look at a couple of examples where arrays don't help, and yet we have things that are related we'd somehow like to consider and organize together. If we're trying to describe one house in a neighborhood, I need to know where it is, its XY, its color, its number of windows. All of that information is related in that it belongs to the description for one house. Information about a single student. A student has a name, an ID, a GPA, maybe grades for various classes, a schedule, and so forth. That information isn't all of the same type, but it is all related to a particular student. Arrays don't help us in those situations. Here's another example that we'll use several times in this lecture. We have a hypothetical insurance company, and it's going to keep track of its policyholders. For each policy, the company needs to keep a, an account number, an age, a monthly premium, and probably other things that we won't use. But the organizational problem is the same as with the two previous examples. We have data that's related. It all belongs to a single policyholder but it's all different types. To solve this problem, we need a brand new data structuring concept, which we'll call a struct. Let me give you a definition. A struct is a collection of values of possibly differing types. So you see here already a difference between structs and arrays. Given this collection, we're going to name it as we did with arrays, but Unlike arrays, we won't use numbers for the individual parts or components. We'll give those names and refer to them by name. So in the insurance policy example, if Alice is a policyholder, then informally we might represent her data like this. Alice is the owner of the account. It has a certain number. We know her age. We know her sex. We know the premium she's supposed to pay. Now, if we had our definitions complete and set up properly in the C program, we might be able to see things like this in the program. Alice's age is 23. And the way we would extract that from Alice's information is by writing Alice and then a period or dot and the name of the field or component. So Alice.age refers to the value 23. We can use these expressions of structs like we can other individual variables in C. So Alice.premium has a value. It's at 42.17. I could use it in an expression, multiply it by 2, and get an answer of 
0.34. This slide shows all of the basic principles and a lot of the basic notation for structs. So if you get lost later on in some of the details and examples, you might want to come back here and just look at this clear, simple, but incomplete example as a way of getting reoriented. Let's start looking at some of the, the details. There is some new syntax that, unfortunately, we'll have to um, learn so that C will understand our intentions. It turns out that there are several different ways the C language allows us to define and declare structs. Different textbooks follow different patterns. The pattern we'll follow in this course is that we'll always declare a new type and within it specify the fields of the struct. Then later in the program we'll define variables that we need using this new type. The type is something we'll define only once. We'll put those declarations at the top of the program like other things which we want to do only once but need to use throughout the program, such as pound define symbols. Once we've put that information to the top, we can declare variables with this type anywhere we need to inside the program. Now, how about the syntax itself? Well, here it is, and you just have to learn it. It's not really that hard after you've done it a couple times. We'll always start by writing this new keyword, type def. And in our current course, we will never use type def for any other purpose. So if you're reading a book that has a long, complicated discussion of type def, you can pretty much skip it. Come back to this slide. This is the only use we will make of type def in this course. Following type def, you write the word struct, another keyword. And then following that, we have our old friend, the curly braces. Up to this point in the course, curly braces were used to group together statements to make them into one. Here, we're not going to group statements. Instead, we're going to group declarations. The concept is a similar, is a similar one to grouping statements, though. We want to take all of these declarations and consider them as a single unit. In the example I have here, I have four declarations for account, age, sex, and premium. There's nothing special about these because they're part of a struct. They would follow all the normal rules that C requires. And I might add, you should also follow all the normal style rules that the people reading your program might desire, like having a comment on each declaration to tell what its intention is. Now, there's something quite important about this uh, new structure, which is different from anything we've seen. It's not obvious by looking at it. What we've just done in setting up this type def struct for account record is declare a new data type. We have not declared a variable. What is the difference? Well, the data type is a general pattern. The data types built into C, like int and double, have certain characteristics, certain operations that can be performed, certain bit patterns that occur in memory. But when I say int i, I am saying that i is a variable, and it occupies memory. The same sort of thing will happen here. I'm saying that account record has this characteristic. It's made up of these four parts. But I'm not saying that there's an area in memory called account record that can hold data. All I'm saying is that this is the pattern that account record will have. This may seem like a small or technical difference, but it's actually quite important when we write and think about the program. As I mentioned earlier, putting good comments on your variables inside the struct is a good point of style. As another point of style, place the type defs near the top of the program file so they can be used by everything that follows it. Now, if the type defs only define a type, how do I get variables? How do I get actual memory that can hold values? To do this, I have to have a variable declaration, just as I would have to declare an int variable if I wanted to have one. The pattern for this declaration looks just like patterns we've seen before in C. It starts with a type 
and then continues with the name of the variable. So if I want a variable named Alice that contains an account age, sex, and premium, then I would write the declaration account record Alice. I could follow that by another variable declaration, account record Bob. This says that Bob follows the same pattern. And now what I have in memory are two different areas, one named Alice and one named Bob. Each of them has the same pattern or the same layout and can contain values named account, age, sex, and premium. We've already seen the notation for getting inside that struct variable and pulling out the value of a part or a field of it. We give the variable name, followed by a period, and then followed by a field name. Okay. So alice.age, as we saw before. We could use these on the left-hand side of an assignment statement as well. So to put a 23 into Alice, alice.age gets 23. To assign her a premium, alice.premium gets 12.20. I could then use that value in expressions on either side of the assignment and change the value stored in the uh, variable within Alice. Once I have selected a field from inside the struct, I follow all the rules for that type. Alice.age is not a struct. Alice is the struct. Alice.age is just a simple int, so I can apply to it any other operations I could apply to any int, such as using the post increment operator, Alice.age++. Alice.age is just an int, so I could print f it, and I don't need any special new format specifier or placeholder because alice.age is an integer and we already know how to print integers. The same is true with scanf. The format specifier or placeholder for scanf has to be percent %lf for the premium. That's a, a floating point value. It's not special because it's inside a struct. It's also not special in its use of pointers. Alice.premium is simply a double. It's not a struct. It's not a pointer to a double. So the correct usage in scanf must be ampersand alice.premium. In some languages, by the way, what we're calling struct in C are referred to as records or structures. So if you hear me use those terms or someone else talking about programs, they are just referring to the same thing. The fields are often called components or members. All of those are commonly used interchangeably. Occasionally, I'll use the word element, but usually element suggests an array rather than a struct. And you can, as you can already see, arrays and structs are quite different. The reason we use structs is to get around the limitations of arrays and be able to collect values together that are treated as a unit. Now, sometimes this is just a matter of being compact in our programs or making them readable or maintainable. If I'm talking about money, I could talk about dollars and cents as two individual things, or I could group those concepts together and use money. Then I could declare variables of type money. They would all have inside them dollars and cents, but for much of the program, I wouldn't have to worry about the details of what's inside. I could just refer to a new high-level concept called money. Same is true with a common idea like time. Although we might want to keep timings of a movie or, or a CD in terms of hours, minutes, and seconds, other times asking or describing the time of something by using a single word time would be much more convenient. This is an example of a process we call abstraction, something that computer scientists do frequently and frequently search for opportunities to do. It's a process of looking for what's general, of getting past the details, of finding something in common so we can use a higher level concept instead of always worrying about the parts. It's seeing the forest and not the trees. 
Structs are our first example of being able to define our own types. Now, it turns out C has a few more types other than int, double, and char, but really not a lot more. Most of them are just variations of those. It certainly doesn't have anything like an account record or a student or time or money. And yet, when we're writing programs about the real world, those are the concepts that come up over and over again. With the struct idea, we'll be able to define those types and use them meaningfully uh, in our programs. In other languages, this ability to define new types is even more advanced. Like arrays, there are some limitations on our use of structs. Uh, however, we must be careful because the limitations aren't exactly the same as those for arrays. So it's best just to step back and learn them uh, on their own. We can't compare two structs directly. It would be really nice if we could. Unfortunately, that's not allowed in C. We can't read or write an entire struct with a scanf or printf. Now, does this contradict an example I gave just a few slides ago? I had a scanf and also a printf. But what were those functions operating on? They were not operating on structs. They were operating on fields within the structs that we had extracted using the dot operator. Once we've extracted those fields, they're just simple types of whatever they are, and we can apply the rules for those types to them. Unfortunately, I can't read or write the entire struct. Now, I can do those things on individual fields, and I could also write my own functions that take a struct and do something to it. We'll see some examples of those as we go along. Here's something that's really nice about structs. It was not true for arrays. I can assign one struct variable to another. I don't need to go through and copy each component. And I can use the ordinary gets operator on this. I can also do uh, something else that's very nice. I can have a function return a struct value. We'll see an example later of where that's useful. Let's look at a struct assignment example. Here we have two account holders, uh, Bob and Dilbert. Now, Bob already has uh, information about his account set up. And we know that Dilbert is going to have exactly the same information. He's going to have the same account, age, sex, and premium. You could write a series of assignment statements to pull out those variables and assign them one after the other. Or you could just write the first line that's in pink there, Dilbert gets Bob. This one line is equivalent to writing a series of statements to copy all the data individually. And so after that one line, all of the fields will be copied. This would be true even if the struct had many dozens or hundreds of individual fields, as it could. There is no restriction on the number of components we could have. This is a very convenient thing. Structs can be used as parameters. Now, individual uh, elements follow the rules for those types. But we can pass an entire struct to a function. We'll need to look at a couple examples to uh, be sure we're comfortable with that idea. We'll be able to call them either by value, have the value copied to the parameter, or as pointer parameters. So again, this is a difference in the way structs works compared to arrays. With arrays, we did not have this choice. All arrays were automatically passed by reference. There's also a way to initialize structs when they're declared. This looks similar to the notation for arrays. We use a curly bracket, another use of that uh, familiar construct. And inside, we list the values we want to have assigned in the order in which they are declared. So the 970142 will be assigned to whichever uh, field was declared first. So it's important to put these in the right order. Let's go back now to an example we worked out when we talked about pointer parameters. And I'll show you how we can rework this with structs in a way that I, I hope will convince you 
of the uh, elegance and uh, usefulness of this approach. Now, the code that we worked out ended up looking like this. Remember, the problem was to find the midpoints of a line. We need a lot of parameters because to describe the line, we need two sets of x's and y's. And then to give back the answer, we needed two values. And since we're computing and changing that value, those have to be pointer parameters. So we end up with a function that has six parameters, two of which are pointers. And inside the function, we've got to be careful to dereference the pointers in order to get the data stored properly. Okay. Then when I call the function, it's also messy. Corresponding to the function, I have to have six arguments. And you see an example call to midpoint at the bottom of the screen. Now, one reason you might have felt that this was unsatisfactory, even back when we looked at it the first time, was that the notion of a point on a screen or a point in the plane, in some sense, is a single idea. It's an abstraction. I'd like to be able to talk about a point without having to constantly be aware that it's really two values, an x and a y. In some logical sense, there should be two parameters to this function, each one of which is a point. And not only that, but it ought to somehow be able to return a point from this function, instead of having to return, not actually return, but to have two parameters which are changed by values. We couldn't do that up to this place in the course. But now we can, because with structs, we'll be able to abstract this notion of a point into something with a single name. And then we'll be able to pass it to a revised version of this function in a much cleaner way. Let's get started on this by defining that abstraction of a point. Okay. This will be a data type, because I want to use many instances of it, or examples of it, or declare many variables of it in different places in the program. So the uh, outline for declaring any struct is you say type def struct. In the curly braces, you put the list of variables or components. Then you follow that by the name of the type and finally a semicolon. In our case, let's call this abstraction point. And the only two pieces of data I'll store there, at least for now, are x and y. Both of those are doubles. Some graphic systems actually might want you to have ints here. We'll use doubles for our example. In a function, perhaps a main function, I could now declare variables of type point, as I've done when I say point A. Not only that, but I could choose to give them initial values at the same time. So here I've got point A initialized to the coordinates of the origin. Point B has an x coordinate of 5, a y coordinate of 10. The point named M is uninitialized. Let's use M to hold the result we're getting back from our midpoint. Now, without turning this into the function, the algorithm that I want to execute is shown in the last two lines there. I want the x value of point M to be the average of the x values of A and B. I want the y value of M to be the average of the y values. And that's how we would write it using the point type and the dot notation. Let's take this and package it into a function. And here, finally, I'll get a function in what I think is a reasonable form for this problem. You see it there. The function's name is midpoint. Note that it takes only two parameters, or two points. This corresponds with our abstract, everyday understanding of what a point is. It's a single thing. It occupies a place in space. And what we're returning is a third point. And so we have a much cleaner way of describing and calling this function. Two parameters only and a return type. Now, inside the function, all I have to do is be careful. I'm referencing the right uh, part of the right variable, and everything will work fine. So mid.x is a local variable. It will be used to hold the result of the calculation temporarily. 
So when I finish the two assignment statements, mid, which is a point, contains the right values, and I can return it as a value of the function. I can return struct values as function return types. Extremely convenient and useful in C. To call this function, it would look something like what's at the very bottom of the screen. I've got my variables declared as before. Now when I call the new version of the function, I can say simply m gets midpoint parameters a and b. Let's trace this just to make sure we understand. I have the variables of main shown there. Uh, a and B have been initialized. Uh, M is uninitialized. When I call midpoint, the parameters get their values by copying. Pass by value. So PT1 has the values copied from A. PT2 has the values copied from B. The local variable midpoint is uninitialized. I'll be setting it to some value as, a, as the function executes. OK, let's do the first assignment statement. Mid sub x gets the expression on the right. Well, that changes only mid sub x. And then the second assignment changes only the y component of mid. At this point, we're at the statement return mid. Let's remember what return does. It does a couple of things. It terminates the execution of the program, and it sends the value back to the caller. So as I execute the statement mid, the trace for it disappears. It's taken out of memory. And the value that was stored in mid comes back and is now effectively on the right-hand side of that assignment statement, m gets midpoint a, b. What happens next is the assignment statement can complete execution. We know the value of the right side of the statement. We take that value, we store it into M. Now, M itself is a struct. And struct assignment copies all of the values, all of the fields simultaneously. So in one flash, I now have values in the X and Y fields of M. And that concludes the trace of this program. Let's stick with the example and add uh, a refinement, or rather an alternate way of programming this. Not that it's necessarily better, but it is slightly different and will give us a chance to review our knowledge of pointer parameters. The first version that I developed way back of the midpoint function had two output parameters, or pointers. With the revised version I just showed you, I had no output parameters, but I had a return value. Let's reprogram this to do the same algorithm, except give the value back as a single parameter, which have to be a pointer to a point. If we do that, the function will start out this way, three parameters, pt1, pt2, and the third parameter is now a pointer to point. The return type of the function is void. We no longer have to return anything from it. When I call the function, I'll have to be careful to get all the types right, including the pointers. And so the third parameter has to be a pointer to a point. I want the answer to appear in M. M is not a pointer, it's a struct. So ampersand M is the right thing to write. How about the code inside the new version of this midpoint function? Here, again, I can apply principles I already know about how uh, pointers work, about how structs work, about how parameters work. I will need to dereference the pointer. Mid is now a pointer in this function. That will give me a struct. Then, within the struct, I can do the uh, selection of x or y. So I have two operators to perform, and I have to get them in the right order. There is a little bit of a technicality here. If you go to a reference book and you look up these operators, star and dot, and see what their precedence is, you'll find that it's the reverse order of precedence to what we want to have happen here. We want the dereference to happen first and the selection or dot next. It turns out the default precedence is the reverse of that. So to make it happen the way we want it to, Let's put parentheses around star mid. 
that will force the dereference to happen first. Okay. With this consideration, it's now straightforward to rewrite our code using mid as a pointer. Okay. We'll say parenthesis star mid dot x gets, and then the same expression that we had before on the right-hand side. You bought it a little bit by having to write these parentheses here. We've seemed to do without them so far in a lot of cases. It is kind of an annoyance. In fact, it's annoyance enough that uh, we'll see an alternate notation for doing it that programmers most often use. Let's stick with this notation for the moment, though, just to make clear the order in which the operations are done. As we trace the program, we have the variables in main, which have initial values from the declaration, or in the case of M, are left undeclared. As we go into set midpoint, the first two parameters get their value by copy, but the third one is this pointer. So the way to visualize its value is this way. It's an arrow pointing at M. Now, don't think of it as pointing at either X or Y. Think of it as pointing as at M overall. As we execute the assignment statements in the function, we're first following the arrow and then selecting X and assigning it. Then, in the next assignment, we follow the arrow, go inside the box, pick out Y, and assign to it. That's the way to think of this. Now, as the function returns, all those locals go away. Function is void. It's not sending a value back, but it doesn't need to because the value has already been stored in the actual locations in memory where we wanted it. Let's go back for this pointer shorthand. This operation of following the pointer and then selecting a field just occurs all the time in C programs that use structs because uh, pointer parameters are very common. Even many standard libraries that you might want to use may force you to use pointer parameters, even if it wouldn't be your choice. So to avoid having to put the parentheses there all the time, there's a special shorthand. We can write the structure pointer name. And then what I'll read is an arrow. Actually, on the keyboard, it's two keystrokes. It's a minus sign and a greater than written right next to each other. And following that, the name of the component. This is nothing more than abbreviation for uh, putting the struct p star in parentheses and following that with dot component. There is a fancy name for this I found in one reference book, the indirect component selection operator. But I don't know of any programmer who ever refers to it as that. They just say it's the arrow. Let's rewrite our midpoint example with the arrow. It's a very small change. In the left side of the assignment statements, it's now mid arrow x and mid arrow y. Not only is it a little easier to write because of the parentheses are gone, but it also is suggestive. It tells the reader immediately that a pointer is involved and even tells you which direction it's pointing in. Let's summarize now. Structs collect variables or fields together, possibly of differing types. They could also be the same type. The fields have individual names, as opposed to arrays where we refer to the fields or the elements by numbers. The dot operator is used to access them. Struct fields follow the rules for their types, including how they can be used uh, and what operations are legal with them. An entire struct can be assigned, and that's often very helpful. Structs are a very important tool for organizing data. And now I promised I'd give you one last reason why structs are important. In the last several years, a popular new paradigm for programming has emerged called object-oriented programming. Languages like C++ and Java and many others are examples of this. It is difficult now for programmers to work without being aware of this new paradigm and these languages. Well, it turns out that the basis for object-oriented programming is a concept called the class, which exists in all of these languages. And the class 
is nothing more than a struct with some additional features. So by learning structs and learning well how to use them, both from the syntactic point of view and from a design and organizational point of view, you are putting yourself well along the road to this important new paradigm that everyone will be talking about, object-oriented programming. Please join me next time as we'll continue with another topic in this course.